but it. and I got this is averted right now. Okay, right. Bye. Sorry, I knew I was like, I got to test this or something's going to go real wrong. Hello and welcome. Good morning to the third day of our virtual STEM Summit. I'm Marie Poloni, the Director of Talent Attraction and STEM Development. We're thrilled to have you join us today featuring the creative mind of Reagan Heller. She's Vice President of Art at Shell Games. And we have student and educators joining us today from over 193 different educational institutions. We want to take this time to say thank you to each and every educator, administrator, and school staff for continuing to fight for our students and families. We applaud you for the work that you do every single day. We're so grateful for you, especially during these times. At the Pittsburgh Te Technology Council, we work to connect the talent and the curious students of our region to our members. And we have more than 1,000 local technology businesses, manufacturing firms, and life sciences related organizations. These industries have come together to help make our region a better place to live, a better place to work, and build amazing companies that together really do work to change the world. And these companies, we recognize all of the talent that each of you as students hold and are excited that you are their future. In other words, these companies really want us to tell all of you about some of the fun and exciting jobs that are available for you to pursue right here in Pittsburgh. And Shell Games is definitely one of them and you're gonna see that today. Today, this is being recorded um, thanks to Pittsburgh Community Television, PCTV. It's also being simultaneously broadcast. and will be available on demand on PCTV's website along with our own website. And we upload these videos to YouTube and then create a library. Today and each and every day of the STEM Summit, we really want maximum participation from all of you. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you can see um, a Q&A. If you have a question, please type it into that Q&A and I will do my best to get to everybody's question today. If you wanna raise your hand to make sure I see it, if I miss it at first, please do that. No one can see your names. Nobody can see who you are. They're all very private questions, so it's very safe, but I wanna make sure that I get your questions answered. Um, in addition, we have Alexis with us today. If you wanna give a wave, we have Emma with us today. These are two student co-hosts and they are going to be starting our show today with some polling questions for all of you just to see what do you know about shell games? Have you ever played any of shell games? So they're going to introduce their themselves in just one minute and then we're going to hear from Reagan at shell games. So I'm going to let Alexis start off. So go ahead Alexis, you can introduce yourself. Hi, I am Alexis Kitsko. I'm a senior at Central Valley High School out in Beaver County. Um, I am current. Oh, there's the poll. I'm sorry. I should have rehearsed this more. Sorry, guys. Um, let's see how pop quiz. How much do you guys know about shell games in the United States? Where the show games rank as a full service education and entertainment game development company. Are they the largest, second largest, 10th or in the top 
We are lucky to have Alexis here today. So Alexis will be popping in with questions throughout the presentation too. Go ahead and vote on your screen. And if you are joining as a group, um, like the amazing students at Franklin Regional, they have a pretty fantastic librarian and she has a whole room full of students who came down today. This is Belle Giovanni. You guys can log in yours and I'll end the poll, share the results. Alexis, what did they say? Um, most people guess that it was in the top 25%. I would say that this would be pretty accurate, seeing as that there are far more um, well-known game companies such as Nintendo, Sega, even Microsoft. Um, those would be up in the top 10 per se. But yeah, I would say that they would be in the top 25%. Well, I will help you out and tell you that as far as full service education, entertainment, game development, Shell Games in Pittsburgh is the largest. So you weren't oh. wrong when you said top 25%, but they are actually the largest. Isn't that cool? I oh. think that's super cool. <laughs> so this is a real privilege today. Um, Miss Emma, are you ready? All right, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'll put the poll up on your screen and students, make sure that you close out of the poll um, after we share results. Otherwise it'll be on the screen. Go ahead, Emma. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm in seventh grade and I go to Franklin Regional. So this poll is, have you ever played any of the following games? Um, the games are, and, <laughs> Mission, it's complicated, deep recovery, which is if you've been to Sea World, Happy Atom, Dominated World a AR, I've Expected You to Die, Inner Cube, The World of Lux, and Mass Merch. And art. <laughs> I know, they're tough if you haven't played yeah. them. Mechatars and the Null Point are down there at the bottom. Nicely done, oh, Emma. I didn't see that. Look, it's pretty cool. Some of you have played these. Go ahead and keep voting. We'll leave it up there for a second. I bet you didn't know these were developed right here in Pittsburgh when you were playing them. Go ahead and log in your answers. We'll leave it up there for another minute or two. Second or two, I guess I should say. And then Emma, once we share these results, the one that is most popular should end up being red. You can let everybody know. All right, I'm gonna end the poll, share results. So the most one that people have played is Happy Adams, which is 33%. Very cool, and I know that Reagan is gonna talk about a new game that they are putting out, or it maybe just went out, so you're gonna to get to really experience that, but I'm gonna turn it over to Reagan from Shell Games Thank you for being here today. This is really a special treat. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I'm really excited to, to be here. Um, what I'm gonna be doing is sharing screen with you guys. Um, so again, we've invited Emma and Alexis to stop and ask questions at any time. I could talk about art in games for, for quite some time. So feel free to interrupt me. I'm really here to answer your questions. Um, so without going on too much more, I'm just going to quickly share screen with you guys and show you a presentation. All right. Um, so again, my name is Reagan Heller. I'm the, the vice president of art um, at Shell Games. Uh, that is an independent third party game developer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is the, the picture and the little blurb that comes from uh, the website. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that role means in a minute because I get that question quite a lot. Um, but we do work on our own independent development. That's games that we um, conceptualize and develop ourselves, uh, as well as we work with clients such as, um, you know, they list some really great names down here, Disney, Pixar, Google, Facebook. Work for a lot of different platforms. Um, may I, Ooh, may I ask exactly what you worked on with Disney? Um, 
I have worked on a few pieces with them, but unfortunately I can't go into too many details because of NDAs. Um, we're very respectful of those, but um, certainly I think we can talk about some of the work that we had done for uh, Toontown in relation to uh, Jesse Shell's work um, with them in his past career. So uh, yes. You can't name like a product? Um, unfortunately, I can't name too many of them, no. Um, there was that. We also were working with them on some Pixie Hollow development, um, if anyone remembers that MMO. Oh, yeah, that right. was a browser one, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I left this picture on the screen too long. Mostly, it's just the spooky season and I cut my hair and I hate that picture on the website. So I, I popped this one in for you all. All right. Um, one question I get an awful lot because it's an unusual title is what is a vice president of, of art? Um, so just to put that in perspective, aside from the spiel that they put on the website, I'm, I'm responsible for running the art department at, at our studio. Um, and actually that number is more along the lines of 140 to 150 at this point. Um, so that includes executive art direction. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to leave our studio unless it's quality. So working with art directors, working with clients to make sure they're pleased with all of the art, touching and, and kind of helping to guide or have conversations about each of the different projects and products that we're working on in the studio. Um, also engaging clients for new work. So, um, you know, reaching out, talking to potential new clients, developing pitches, developing um, response documents for bids. Um, building and managing the department structure of artists, making sure that we have the right artists to match the kind of work that we are doing. And then I'm balancing specialties and skill sets and growing those people as individuals as well. So they're continuing to de develop themselves as, um, as artists. Um, fostering growth in tools and processes. The game development industry is always changing. We are always using um, more cutting edge technology um, and making sure that we're, we're staying on top of that so we can always do our best work. Um, also, uh, I'm responsible for hiring artists. I know that's of uh, a lot of importance to students that I speak to. What do I look for in artists, etc. And then sometimes I do artwork myself. Most of the time that is along the lines of concept art or um, paint overs um, because my history is in conceptual art and 2D art. Um, so that's another question I get a lot. How did you become a, a VP of art? Um, I, I did begin as a concept artist and a texture artist back in the dinosaur days where um, textures and 3D models were done more separately than they are now. I became more of a lead artist and primary 2D artist on our projects. Um, then I began art directing, so guiding others towards either the client's direction or vision or something that we had created ourselves together. And then I began to take on more management responsibilities, management being um, coaching people in their career, um, in their, their own growth development, um, providing feedback. Um, and then I started to pick up more of those vice president type responsibilities, overseeing more happening in the studio, growing at more of a studio level. And then for me personally, there was the choice to let go of individual project art direction. And as we grew focus on management and the vice president or more executive level um, directorship within the studio. Um, I wanted to point out to people uh, I, I have been in the industry 17 years, but that is a little bit um, young, honestly, for a vice president role. It helps that I helped grow the company that I'm at right now. And this is a very different path for, for an artist. Many people will take the role of, man, just I wanna be a lead concept artist or wow, I'd really like to be uh, an art director in my career. So there's lots of places that you can take this. Okay, um, but text is, is really boring and I'm, I'm showing you a lot of text with this white screen. So I wanna get past that. Um, what I do wanna talk about is what sorts of roles exist in game development for artists and, and also answer the question, why, why is an artist talking at, at a STEM summit? 
Um, and I, I like to reference um, back when I was in school, I did not think I could possibly be a game developer. I didn't even know that was an option for me because I thought you really had to be um, you know, deeply involved in programming or deeply involved in technology in order to be part of, of that kind of a career. And um, I had a friend who was a CS major and he was like, well, you know, that's, that's not really true. You can be an artist and still be part of the process of making games. Like there are places that you're gonna be very involved in those technological aspects and be able to communicate well and be a good teammate for more engineer-minded people. But you yourself don't have to be a CS major to do that. Um, and I'm glad I took his advice and started taking more um, classes and really learning more about making games because that's, that's absolutely true. And when I'm talking about these roles, what I'm also gonna highlight is not just the uh, the artistry necessary for these roles, but the communication collaboration and technical knowledge that naturally artists lean into in order to be part of game development that varies from having meaningful conversations with engineers and designers and being able to implement things in an engine lightly all the way towards um, some aspects of programming or shader development or tools development. So there's, there's this wide gamut of ways that you can be artistic and technical within game development. Um, but let's go ahead. What I'd like to show you is um, a, a trailer that we have for one of our new games that we've worked on. We're extremely excited about it. It actually did launch on the Quest and PlayStation VR uh, just this week. This is the teaser trailer that we had developed when we went into early access. This is um, our own original IP. So we were able to develop all of this idea in house. The art director had a great deal of creative freedom with the team to come up with the look, the feel, the sound of the game. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to show it to you so that we could then use this as a case study and sort of break down, okay, what are all the art roles that actually went into making this game? I will mention if there's anyone here who has questions about uh, engineering or about game design, I can speak to them and answer questions fairly broadly, or at least point you in the direction towards things you could reference to answer questions that I'm not entirely certain about. So don't hesitate to ask about questions that aren't necessarily art related. I'd be happy to talk about those as I can. So I'm going to I'm going to shut up now and just let you watch this trailer because it's pretty cool. Defend yourself. Wake up, champion. Our city lies in ruin. In its place, monsters and twisted spirits now thrive. Show these creatures what you should do. Reagan, that was super cool. And I love that we were able to actually see it. And now we're going to be able to break it down. If you want to show your face on your screen, sure. They can, they'll be able to see it side by side. Sometimes it's just nice to see the person behind the presentation. Can are you able to just undo your video at the bottom? Oh, but you can't share your screen at the same time. I don't think so. No. Okay. All good then. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I just wanted to be able to see you at the same time. All right, go ahead. Back to the show. <laughs> All right. So hold on. Let me boot this back on and go back to presenting. Yeah, I'm sorry. The pictures are much more interesting than, than my face, I, I promise. Um, 
So yeah, uh, I wanted to yet. try sharing again. Oh, I'm so sorry. Don't be, I'm the one who interrupted you. Oh no. All right, here we go. I'll do it again. There you go, perfect. All right. Go ahead. Got it, okay. Um, so uh, I did wanna talk a little bit about um, the specialties in game art. And I know I have very limited time. So I'm gonna really kind of like breeze through these real fast, but there are a number of sub-disciplines in game development um, that all went into to making this game. It was a highly collaborative effort. And I, I think it's oftentimes a little surprising to know just how many different focuses it takes to, to put together something like this. And this is just within the art department. So I'm gonna touch on um, 3D and environment art and character art, uh, 2D concept art, uh, VFX art, which is the, the visual effects, um, explosions, sparks, et cetera, magic. Uh, technical art with a little bit of a focus on rigging here because rigging was so crucial to this game's development. Animation, uh, user experience design and user interface art and audio. What exactly is rigging? I've heard that term before, but I'm not exactly sure what it means. Yeah, um, I go into that a little bit with some pictures, but on a high level, I can answer that um, technical art is a very wide umbrella. Usually what that is, is a role that straddles um, engineering and tools development and artistry. Rigging specifically is sometimes known as a character TD or a technical animator. But a rigger is someone who works very closely with the modeler for a 3D modeler, as well as the animator. And they are putting together the skeleton and control set for oh. a character so that it can move and animate. And I have an example in here um, as we get a little further that hopefully will kind of illustrate that better. Um, but that's a, very, that's a very good question. I think the actual industry sometimes has a hard time, you know, defining technical art versus rigging. Cool. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about concept art because concept art, when people think about that, usually they think about that in terms of just pure illustration. Um, and you know, how, how is that really related to the development of the game? Um, you know, how is that integrated with the uh, development and engineering? And the answer is quite a lot more than people think. Concept art um, is different than pure illustration. Um, yes, there's always a gorgeous illustration at the end. You can see um, one of our concept art artists, Ryan Yee, did this final piece of our avatar, the Rune Knight over here. And we have another piece over here by Astro, which is more um, environmental. Uh, but a lot of the work that doesn't end up being seen is very similar to the little silhouette sketches above here of the figure of the avatar character. Concept artists really need to communicate super well with designers and engineering to conceptualize the world and the characters. Um, I like to tell concept artists 90% of their work usually ends up kind of on the cutting room floor because we are iterating and developing. They need to know the engine. They need to know what the engine limitations are, how it is possible to light things in there, how the foliage could possibly work. Um, aspects of how the character needs to be able to move for the gameplay. Um, understanding like, oh, can we have cloth? Are we gonna be able to support that skeletal mesh for the performance of the engine? There's actually a lot that goes into that in terms of communicating with the other developers and having a really excellent eye for just uh, being able to create gorgeous artwork. Um, so I, I did want to make sure that I focused on that because we ask our concept artists to really be involved in that design process and really understand the game, be involved in the development of the game, um, and listen to our engineers about what we can and cannot do in the engine and come up with a vision that can be very closely followed into the development of the character models and the environment models. Um, so environment art is actually a very multi-talented uh, role within our studio. So this is work by um, Matthew Klein, one of our environment artists. Uh, 
it's important not only as you can see to have really wonderful composition set dressing um, thinking about where you want to draw the eye you know the color balance etc but this doesn't start out like that it starts out working with designers very similar to that that little white set of cubes all in an order up at the top that's called white boxing um, so our 3d environment artists work with the designers to build the levels according to how um, the player will move through it and what they want them um, to be able to navigate and then we'll test that make sure that's okay and then start working towards okay how are we going to hit that concept look working with the art director to build out the models, the textures, the kits that are necessary to be put into the engine in a specific way to efficiently build these sets. Um, and that does have to be done according to the spec and budget for the engine that you're working in. So you have to have an understanding of the technical limitations of the platform. Um, how do um, you know, how do the kits work together? How are you most efficiently using your textures? How many draw calls can you have at any one point of time? How is the occlusion calling going to work? I know I'm throwing out words that, you know, sound highly technical. And we, we expect our um, environment artists to not only have this wonderful sense of composition, color, modeling, sculpting, texturing, but also be able to work well with our engineers in engine to get that effect. And then character art, it is very similar. Um, this is uh, Chris Cleave's work. Um, he was our primary character artist on Until You Fall. He needed to work with the concept artist, the art director. He worked very closely with design. He needed to make sure that he was building these models in a way where they were moving as they would actually move in the game, uh, that they would be able to perform all the functions we were hoping our player would be able to form and look great, have a high quality look. Um, that also includes monsters and bipeds and all kinds of things. So this, uh, I wanted to share this as well because I just love this, it's our boss monster. Um, and it, it's using a very similar philosophy. While not human, it had to do very particular things for design. It had to stay within the technical limitations of the game and um, it had to be rigged. So this is an illustration of what um, Alexis had asked about before. This is um, an example of our, um, our rigor Abby's work on the project. She was responsible for working with the 3D artist, the designers, the animators, and the engineers to create and craft a specific control set for the character. Um, and it kind you know, it's kind of like, oh, you could just put a skeleton in there and it's gonna move appropriately, but you really have to work within the limitations. And also there are lots of special things that animators want these characters to do. So this one in particular had a lot of cloth on her. She had to create a skeleton for the cloth to be animated. Um, she does a lot of flips and ninja-like moves in the environment. So there are very specific ways that that control set had to work for our animator. Um, this role does involve um, quite a lot of in-engine or in Maya uh, ability to use tools, being able to script in order to create particular controls or tool sets. Um, so this one really, I think, is one of those roles that straddles between art and engineering really nicely. And she has a background in animation. I always think that makes riggers really, really great at what they do because they know how things move and they want things to move. And this is pretty cool. So this is, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about animation. And again, I'm breezing through everything really cursory because I wanna leave time for questions, but this is Kyle Kenworthy, our principal animator. Um, and he was filming himself uh, looking awesome and doing this particular move that our night enemy did. Um, animators uh, in the game industry are a little bit more specialized and different than animators within the film industry. And this is because for film, of course, you want to have all of the great fundamentals for animation, good weight, um, you know, balance, personality and performance, all of that is critically important. But there's another aspect for game devs where these characters can be 
interrupted at almost any point of time by the actions of the player. So not only do you need to animate, you know, the attack and the block and the death, uh, but the animators need to work very closely with designers as well as engineers so that those animations can blend into each other. So if this knight is attacking you and you block it and you parry it, you're interrupting that animation and it is blending in a very elaborate, um, we call it either a character AI or a system tree within the game engine so that anything that you do to that enemy is going to blend nicely and be good show into another animation. So it all feels real and very natural. And I wanted to discuss VFX art a little bit because this is extremely important in particular to our game because everything really has a way of communicating what the player is doing, what impact it has. And this is another role that I think has a good gamut from being extremely artistic and creative. You know, like what, what are we seeing? How are these colors blending? You know, what is this particular color set consistently used throughout the game mean? And also, as you can see in some of these sketches up here, um, this is uh, the work of uh, Dan Lin and Kwame, Bob, um, our VFX artists on the project, uh, there are parts of it that are super technical. How will it function? How will it be efficient? And there are parts that are extremely creative in terms of just making that look gorgeous, communicate well. You can see this, uh, this ninja lady is kind of caught in this spell effect and then hit into a stagger and a fall and into that death animation back there. And uh, this also blends in a little bit, specifically in, in VR in this game, uh, into the user interface as well. So what you're seeing here is a combination of the VFX as well as the user interface. The shield and that line there are the critical strike things um, that indicate to the player, this is where I should hit. You know, this is where another incoming attack is. I need to block this. I need to strike that. And that gets in a little bit into the user interface designer and the user interface artist. So um, every game has a lot of information it is trying to give to the player. A user experience designer, um, I just pulled up a little sketch here on the top. That's for a, a, a normal website design. So they're thinking about how the flow would work. How does the player navigate through things? How do they experience this? How are they getting the information they need to play the game? So that could um, range from things like, um, you know, text box interfaces telling you, hey, this is what this is what this item will do for you. This is how this weapon is powered up in particular. And in our game, especially in VR, user interface is very much attached to the world. The, the heads up display, um, the indicators on the characters. Um, it's really, it goes from a flat screen and you really try and pull that out into the world itself. Um, we do expect our user interface artists and designers to work super closely, obviously with game design, but also be able to technically implement their work in the engine to know how the engine works, how these objects will layer and animate. Um, so it is, it is very, um, very involved, not only in just the normal Photoshop work and graphic design work, but also the engine work. How is this going to function in there? All right, I swear I only have two more left. Um, but uh, this one- is fantastic. Think, Keep going, you're doing great. <laughs> this one, I think, uh, I love talking about audio because they, they are like the unsung hero of game development. Um, we're super proud of the audio work in this particular game. Um, you know, we decided we wanted to go for the synth wave sound. Um, which I think really added a lot of personality to the game and influenced the way that the visuals started to develop. As soon as we started hearing that music from our audio peeps, um, we were um, integrating that into the game and it was affecting the, the, the visuals for the game. It got more of a neon look and we're, we're really happy with that. 
Um, and audio is actually, in, in my opinion, you know, one of those roles that is much more technical than you suspect. Um, not only does this involve musical composition, which by the nature of the tools you use in, in the modern game industry, you can see are very technical. Um, it's usually all done on a digital interface with digital tools, but um, there's so many aspects of audio design that are important, especially in VR games. Uh, the spatialized design means that the designer is working to place sounds and balance them so that your ear really believes things are at the appropriate depth and space and everything is mixed so that you're hearing the right impact sounds. You know, what, what is, um, what what sound are you are you hearing in the moment that you're hitting that sword so there's a combination of things that happen the sword swipe comes in and there's you know you've hit the user interface crit the vfx is there the animation is there and the sound is that final part that makes that all really believable um, and real quickly, oh yes go ahead what um music interface do your composers use? Like what software are they using to blend that all together? That's a great question. Um, I know that we use um, a number of different tools. There, there's a wide variety in the industry. Um, I know that we use Reaper, um, which is a very goth sounding tool, but um, we use Reaper for a lot of our work in the studio. There's also um, Ableton is another one I've heard of quite a bit. Um, let's see, compositionally. I know there are a few more, but we do focus on Reaper. There are also other tools that are necessary for integrating spatialized sound into the game. Uh, the one that we use is uh, WISE, that's W and then another W, I, S, E, um, which allows the uh, audio developers to actually place that sound vary the sound, balance the sound in the game. Um, I would say that, that WISE is, is definitely a highly necessary tool to know how to use to be a game engine developer as opposed to just an audio composer. Um, but I would, I would definitely recommend researching because there are a number of other programs that can be used, but those are the big ones for our studio, Reaper and WISE. And real fast, just to make sure that they're not neglected, um, there is a lot of artistry in marketing. Um, and even our, the people that work within our studio in, in marketing, of course, they're expected to have great graphic design skills, um, making logos, all the media that's necessary, even to just get on something like the Oculus store or the Steam store, um, all the different pieces that are advertising the game, all the swag, and also the ability to create trailers, um, to create clips, to go in engine. And if our, you know, if we want to talk on Discord about how, oh, we put this new weapon in and it's really awesome, our marketing people will go in in headset, get some footage of doing really cool stuff with that weapon, and then share that with the community. Um, so that's, that's another role that is fairly critical to the success of a game, right? You want to be able to advertise um, you know, how awesome it is to the world. And that actually takes a lot of work and a lot of artistic skill, so. My gosh, I mean, so much great information and I have tons of questions in the chat that I need to ask. Emma, do you want to go first though with any questions before I start to ask some of the ones from the chat? I want to give you a chance. For the um, trailer, who does like the voiceover? How do you make it like sound like, I don't know how to explain it, but like sound like. Yeah, like... so that's a great question. Actually, we worked with an audio director external to our studio and we cast that role. Um, we actually had the opportunity to listen to um, a number of different people who were applying for that role and then choose the person that sounded really great and then work with that director to get the kind of personality we wanted. The voice you were hearing was Agatha and she's kind of your like spirit guide and the person who's forging these weapons for you. So it was really cool to hear the auditions um, of the various voice actors interested in playing that. In looking at different roles, we have several questions just about roles and about mm -hmm. um, the education going forward. So I'm going to start up here with, oh, and Shaler um, Middle School uses Happy Adams as part of their chemistry. Oh, that's awesome. They, um, they put that in here. Um, 
what kind of post-secondary education, if any, would you recommend to students who really want to do art design for games um, mm -hmm. and pursue that with tech? That's from Samantha. Right. Um, well, definitely there are programs that you can go to that specifically focus on games. When I was in school, that that wasn't a thing. And there are so many options now. It's amazing. So, you know, there are places like Full Sail, the Entertainment Technology Center, um, you know, uh, any of the uh, arts programs that have a game, a you know, a Bachelor of Making Games. Um, the one thing that I think people overlook, and I want to make sure that I emphasize, is you really, you don't need a you know, a, a graduate degree in order to make games. It's very important that you make games with other people. Um, I look at that a lot when we're looking at resumes. It's not even so much what school do you go to. The first thing I look at is the portfolio to see the quality of work. And then I look at the resume and I'm like, have they built games with other people? Um, and there are lots of ways you can do that. You can participate in game jams. Um, you can join... Um, uh, you, you can join uh, local groups that will get to like the IGDA, I think is an example. Um, make games with other people because that is an extremely valuable experience, being able to do that cross-discipline work, to understand some of the different disciplines, skills, technologies involved. That speaks quite a lot um, to, to just experience. Um, back, back, oh, back, back. back on the voicing, do you use voicing in game or is that all text-based? Uh, we use a lot of VO in games um, because honestly, you get a lot of more, a lot more personality out of it like that. And especially in VR, text is really hard to read. Like you, you never want to overload people with text. This is a roguelike game. So there is an, an amount of text necessary. People really care about the stats of their weapon and how to level up and what are the extra traits. Um, but at all points, we try and balance text-based information with strong audio. Oh, so your story is based like through audio and voice acting and your RPG MMO stats are text-based? Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. We don't want someone reading the stats to you because I'm not a stat person. I play the game, I'm just swinging my sword, right? Um, but Agatha's voice helps me get more invested in the story. So she doesn't even do a lot of chit chat. She doesn't really expound all the story to you. There's also aspects of environmental storytelling that are really important. So as you're experiencing the game and seeing those environments, that should also sort of be revealing more and more of what's going on. And Agatha's voice is there to emphasize, oh, hey, you know, this is, this is that creature. This is our enemy, we gotta fight him. You know, that, that kind of a thing. So it's a combination of all of those to make sure that we're not leaning too hard in just voice or just text. And we're using the environment to help tell that story. Carlin and Dennis have a similar question to each other. So I think I can sort of combine these. Where do you really go to find applicants for the art department? Mm -hmm. um, so they're talking about art skills. Um, like where, where do you pull from? And then um, no two paths are the same, Dennis is saying. What skills are the most important? And you touched on that already. But just any additional skills and where do you go to look for talent? Yeah, um, the talent question is, is a good one. I love working with people in Pittsburgh. Um, so I, I think that's wonderful. We do have uh, intern and fellowship programs and that's frequently where we find just a, amazing talent. Um, so we do have people apply to us through our um, online postings, as well as sometimes we will go, go to schools. We also host an open house to talk um, about you know, our studio. Obviously we're not doing that anymore right now, um, but we, we are hoping to find ways to engage the community um, to let people know, hey, we, we, we are interested in, in interns and opportunities. Uh, in terms of more, um, more senior individuals, I would say that right now the hot places to look are places like ArtStation. Um, ArtStation is really big right now. Um, TechArtist.org. CG Society. Join these groups on the internet. Um, you guys have the, the internet. It is, it is the most wonderful place because you can post your work. 
you can get critique from other individuals. You can make connections with people already in the industry. You can make mentor-like relationships. And those places often have forums where people will be posting for, hey, we're, we're looking for this. What do, you, what do you think? And the other one, um, I'm sorry, that question was about different paths. Um, and I think that really depends on the person. And in any, you know, in any studio that you're in, hopefully you will have a manager or a mentor who's going to want to talk to you about that because it grows and it, it, it changes as you learn and develop. Um, we, you know, our, our um, I think our most senior 3D environment artist and art director started as an animator and he just grew into really enjoying the craft of making those environments and guiding other people towards a vision. Um, I think for some people, you know, they're very, very craft focused and they're like, hey, I really just want to be an amazing sculptor. I want to make character art and be great at it. And that would kind of have you narrow your speciality, take the right classes, look for the right opportunities to be like a, a senior character um, artist. So there's a lot of ways you can grow. I've seen people grow wildly um, within my own studio. Um, so that is something that you're going to want to keep working on, keep being excellent at what you're best at and keep talking to your manager or your art director about this is what I think I'd love to be great at. I love that you talked about them figuring out what they're passionate about and working to their strengths. That mm -hmm. is really what we want to see these students do. They're so strong and just really following after their passion when they're pursuing a career and trying to integrate them. There's questions now about games and I want to try to get to as many of those as possible in the next okay. minute or two before we finish up. Um, our school, Sam said, our school just purchased a set of quests. Are there any plans to bring Hololad and or History Maker to Quest? Oh, interesting. Um, the, that's much more of a marketing question. Um, at this time, I don't believe that there are plans to do that. Um, I do know that there are ways with the quest that you should be able to cable connect and play um, Rift games on the quest. Um, but I don't think those particular ones we are porting. Um, we are super excited that um, I expect you to die and until you fall. Uh, we were able to port uh, over to the quest. That's super. Uh, that's super cool because it does have a very good um, market uh, penetration. Like a lot of people have quests. They're great. You don't have wires stuck to the back of them. Um, they don't pinch your head as horribly as some of the other ones have, and have really good tracking. So we're very excited about that particular product, and are definitely looking at it for future uh, VR development. And what is your most popular game? That is from Anthony. Oh, um, I, I would say um, I expect you to die. Um, we're really, we, we really love that product. Um, you know, we, we got out there fairly early in the life cycle of VR and um, we've con continued to develop it, um, continuing to, you know, add levels, porting it to the quest. And um, it seems to consistently really sell well and we're very excited. Um, so I think, I think that definitely that one. One of our youngest participants today, it's, her name is Maya and she's only six. She plays Shell's Daniel Tiger online. Oh, and that's she awesome. Wanted, she wanted to know what the hardest part about creating that game um, was. She likes the, especially the tea party part. <laughs> oh, tea, uh, tea party is great. You know, the, the best part of tea party was we got to design all of the little teapots, you know, that, that match the characters. The hardest part of working on those games, I think, is... Um, all the good ideas that we have, fitting them within the technical limitations so that they can run on all these devices. Um, because we want that to be wildly accessible online. And not everybody has a super powerful computer. Um, so I think smartly making sure that we were hitting the design and visual quality that we wanted while making sure that people who were, you know, on a Chromebook or on a tablet would be able to play it is probably the trickiest part is balancing the limitations of the technology with everything we wanted to do to make it look great. I so want to try to get to all these questions. George wants to know, do you currently have any internship opportunities available for 2021 spring and summer? And how would you recommend students to apply? I had typed to a few to check out your website, but mm -hmm. just wanted to see if you look to see internships being open. 
Um, I do think that that's entirely possible. Um, we we are doing um, we are doing a lot of work upcoming uh, in the fall, and I think we are looking positively towards the spring and summer. And I know for me. It's always wonderful to have an extra set of hands. Um, our internships are very hands-on. You are part of the team. The work that you are doing is, is very meaningful and oftentimes integrated into the actual final product. Um, so, you know, I'm always looking for great people that are eager to learn and can offer a lot, I think, to, to the work that we're doing. And yes, you can apply through our, our website. Fantastic. I appreciate everyone joining us today. I know I did not get to each and every question, but we did touch on all of the questions. Um, always reach out to me with more questions and I'll try to get those to Reagan and get those answered and be able to get them back to everybody. But this was fantastic today. Um, I just really want to thank Reagan. You put so much into that presentation and the time that you gave us today. Really thank you so much. I want to thank you, Emma, and I want to thank you, Alexis. Your questions were great and we appreciate you leading us today. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors. Shell Games is one of them, really making this entire STEM Summit possible and free for students and educators. We also had Phillips and Huntington Bank. Everyone contributed so that we were able to bring this for free and live stream it out to all of Western PA. We also are over the United States. We have people joining us from Tennessee. We have people joining us from Atlanta. Um, it's, been, it's been very exciting and we appreciate all of that. Join us tomorrow to see what's going on behind Giant Eagle. It's just not your local grocery store. They're gonna show us all of the tech that is involved um, in filling the orders and filling pharmacy orders, um, looking at the robots that make it all happen. We end the week with Industrial Scientific. There'll be nothing on Monday, that's Columbus Day, and most students have off, and then we'll start back up Tuesday with SDLC partners. Again, I cannot thank you enough. Email me questions as you have them, and I'll try to get more answered from Reagan. I know that their website is also full of information, um, shellgames.com, and just thank you very much. It was great to have everybody here today. Thank you, guys. It was really nice to be able to participate, so thank you for having me. Thank you and have a great day.